Good morning, everyone, and happy Valentine's Day. Um, first of all, before we get started with this Hangout, I just wanted to say thank you so much for everyone for making my day special. All your messages and all your notes for the last two days are so making me mushy, <laughs> which is so perfect because now we are on air doing film and, you know, celebrating and immortalizing this entire experience. So today we are going to talk about crowdfunding and how it is changing the film industry. And it's actually super interesting because it's not like film is not what you think it is um, anymore, which is fascinating to me. And so today we have Brian Risky. How are you, Brian? Hi, thanks again, you Fat, for having me on the show. Yes, this is exciting. So Brian is the guy who like knows everything about film and how it happens and how it's changing. And he is a super duper social media guy who will explain to us how come such films like Iron Sky <laughs> is getting funded. What did he make? Like 700,000 700, euros, yep. right, to make a film about space Nazis. So <laughs> before we go with the entire, uh, before we dive into this specific, let's talk about how is the industry changing, what it used to be before, how films were used to be made, and what is happening right now. Sure. Well, um, thanks again. And I, I just want to say, you know, I'm, I'm just an average guy, and, and I appreciate you lauding my uh, credibility and that sort of thing. My, my background is actually working for the, uh, the government. I used to do journalism for them. So... It's a real treat and pleasure for me to actually participate in the film industry as it's going through this incredible paradigm shift right now uh, in the way films are getting financed and the way they're getting distributed. Um, there's a lot of disruptive technology that's allowing people to successfully tell good stories and get them out to more niche type audiences and, and satisfy groups of people that don't maybe get something that they need uh, from some of the current Hollywood studios that are you know, really pigeonholed into only doing big blockbuster films, what they call tentpole features at this point. Right. So, yeah, so anyway, to kind of go off on your question about, you know, what's kind of going on in the background um, and where things have come from, I could tell you that the film industry, the way it's structured, hasn't really changed much since the, uh, the 1910s. You know, at that time with the Nickelodeons or what Thomas Edison had envisioned, uh, you make a piece of entertaining content and you hold on to that exclusively and you make sure that when people come to see it whether it's imagine like some of the pieces that you'd go when you go to the circus and you go to see the bearded lady you pay your money they let you in the tent you get to see the bearded lady and then that was your special experience and it was exclusive to you and so you could keep track of um, the exclusivity and you could monetize your creative venture in the same way with film you had a tent, some person stood in the back and turned a crank, and that was how the projectors ran, and you give them your nickel, and you go and see it, and then you leave. And they did that in a similar format. They just made it bigger with the you know, multiplexes and that sort of thing, uh, where it was all about exclusivity, and you had to pay your, your money to be able to see something. But nowadays, it's really easy to get distribution out uh, beyond just the theater. Uh, if people may not remember too much, but if you think about it, if you ever remember when uh, you know the Little Mermaid was put into the vault, and some of the Disney classics. Well, what that was at the time was when VHS was getting really big, and Disney was actually protesting from that type of format. They were afraid that people were going to pirate the VHSs very easily. It, it started to take away and eat away the exclusivity uh, and the control that you normally had with cinema. And they, they finally found a way to monetize, and now they roll with it. And now you have formats from, you know, Blu-ray to HD, DVD, and regular DVD now. But uh, you still were dependent upon seeing the theatrical experience in the theater. So they still had some control there. But now what's going on is from your computer, from your iPhone, iPad, any mobile smartphone device, uh, whether it's in your home your, you know, or in the theaters and some of these other traditional formats, uh, you have so much availability and at the same time you're also competing with instead of just like a theater only playing movies you're also experiencing where people are using the same display format to play other things so that could be uh, computer games so when you're on your phone I mean it's it's Angry Birds versus the latest uh, independent feature like Memento or something like that uh, that's that's where the com competition comes in there is no exclusivity as much anymore it's easier for independent film producers to get their content out there and in front of an available audience. 
And it's actually harder, right, for the studios to get their audience because our viewing habits are changing. Is that right? Right, exactly. You know, it may be that you have a huge blockbuster film like Avatar with, you know, Multi, it, you know, it's a hundred million, a couple hundred million dollars in budgeting. Uh, the marketing costs are probably around double that. The uh, the named actors that are involved, the special effects that they're using, the unique aspects of 3D. These are all value propositions. These set that film apart from some guy in his backyard telling a sweet love story in a coffee shop. Okay, what maybe uh, many independent films might choose to to focus on. Well, the difference though is is that. I can go see that movie, or you could see that movie, or you could also go play World of Warcraft. And it, it's they're both bargaining for your attention for the right. same kind of entertainment. Now, what is more competitive? Is it the 3D of Avatar, or is it the fact that World of Warcraft, you're totally invested in the game and in your personal character? You know, that's, that's really where the competition's coming in for the film industry, and they're having to uh, deal with that. And they're not really able to very well. They... Uh, are comfortable with their older models, I'm, and I'm talking about some of the major studios, uh, and so they're moving more into special deals with the part of the value chain. And, and please stop me if I may say something that sounds a little off for different no, viewers. When I'm talking about the value chain, I'm talking about how there is a, a a production company of the film, and then in many cases there is a separate distribution company, and then an exhibition company, and different aggregators and sales agents along the way. And so what's happening is people are trying to integrate down the chain so that that's why you see now, you know, let's say uh, uh, House of Cards is, uh, you know, Netflix is their stab into making content. Google wants to make content. They want to control the whole process. So we're right. actually we interesting are, you know? enough. What's that? We are. We're, um, the Hangouts on Air, This what we're doing right now, we're creating valuable content. And yes. if you have specific channels like the Science Channel or the Entrepreneur Channel like me, or you know, life stories, or Sarah Hill, veterans. So you have specific channels that you know. I'm gonna go and watch this on my Google TV in my living room, exactly. and it's free. <laughs> exactly. So you, in your own way, I mean, you are competing with broadcast te television right now, and some of the you know, Good Morning America. It just it's about the quality of your narrative and and the stories and the people that you bring on as guests. So you have all the tools at your disposal. Right, and so. You know, I found myself actually sometimes sitting in front of the TV and watching YouTube videos on my little phone, on my smartphone, and I was like, dude, this is kind of crazy, <laughs> right? So the content, and I know Google is trying to do that, they're actually trying to have your content follow you rather than you just going and finding where the content is. And so let's talk about that. Let's talk about the channels of where people find our content and why this is actually more helpful for the crowdfunding. Okay, that's a good point. So what you're alluding to is the fact that now people have an ability to find their content online, and, and we could talk about the big five. You know, there's uh, Hulu, Vudu, Google Play, Amazon, and iTunes are the big ones right now in the United States. And there are some smaller competitors that are very niche focused, but essentially you can get out to these groups. Well, what's really unique in, in the aspect that many people are starting to realize with crowdfunding is that crowdfunding is just a, simply an online version of fundraising where I would compare it to a steak dinner that you host, you know, $500, come in, have a steak dinner, the money goes towards a good cause. And you see black tie affairs like that, you know, are pretty common. But with crowdfunding, you don't have to ask for the $500. You just say, hey, how about five bucks in exchange? I'm going to give you some valuable content and you get to participate in a meaningful way in whatever the project is. And so it makes sense that you're also engaging and distributing your content in an online fashion. Because that's the point of purchase, that's the point of interaction. So things are really starting to converge between television and the internet, where people are choosing to get their content, and crowdfunding's right in there with it because it's it's people engaging in different projects through the internet and through their channel, their social channels and that sort of thing. So let's talk about the dividing uh, principles between the independent and the studio productions. And you talked about this a little bit, where you're saying you were talking about the model of the studios and their distribution. Let's talk about what really separates them and why crowdfunding is actually starting to boom, right? Right, sure. So crowdfunding's been around uh, in concept maybe for quite some time as crowdsourcing, uh, but it's come a long ways mostly because of the divergence you're talking about between the independents and the studios. The studios function more as a bank. 
they put together uh, development of different film projects, and then usually they, if they don't have people just in-house working on it, a lot of times they'll outsource to another company, and you would see these companies go and create the film product, but then the studio slap their label on it. Well, they also have special distribution channels that they've already put in place, and so once they take all the intellectual property of that film, once it's done, just like you see a film producer is like a general contractor for designing a house. Once the house is done, it goes back over to the, the whoever owns that plot of land, and it's their will to do with whatever they want. Uh, studios are much the same way. Now, independent films operate a little differently. The way they tend to work is it's usually a clique of people somewhere between the size of maybe three to eight uh, that have a story in mind. They don't want to participate in the Hollywood business model. And so what they do is they seek uh, financing independently from the studios. That's the major thing that separates independent studio-based productions is where the money is coming from. Uh, but I would also say that the business models uh, have to work a little bit differently. So an independent filmmaker will end up producing uh, content thanks to either you know, debt-based financing, which is where you say, hey, people, uh, distribution company, if I put together this package of a product with this named actor, will you promise to distribute my content? And they say, yes, we'll do that. And then the filmmaker can go to the bank, there are about three of them, and get money from the bank as a promissory note because the you know, letter of intent from the distribution company. That is less and less possible. We're seeing more equity-based financing where you go to some people that are you know, quality, uh, I would say qualified investors, meaning they have over a million dollars in you know, uh, yearly uh, revenue in, in terms of their, their net asset worth. And they're able to put together a reasonable package. It's highly risky. Uh, they usually do a slate of films, just like you would a, a portfolio of CDs and you know what makes up a mutual fund. So a couple action films here, a comedy over there, and you know something that's like a a horror slasher. And you produce all these films, and then you go to the film market. And there are about uh, maybe ten decent markets in the world right now. And then there's there are festivals where some buying also takes place. So. The independent film model is to go out, create a piece of content, package it together in a slate, so multiple films, and then you get a distribution company to buy it all, hands down, with a large advance and possibly some royalties built into the deal, depending on where you're at in your film career, and how much the distribution company thinks they really need your content. Because the buying happens just like if you were to buy tennis shoes. You know, you're just going to a place to see, oh, what's the film you have? What's the actor? Okay, great. I'll buy two of these and one of that. So one of the one of the questions that I was thinking about film is that you know we're used to seeing a lot of stuff for free, right, online, but we still expect grand productions. So, and those cost a lot of money, right, in the millions. Or do they cost in the millions, or or you just have to pay Brad Pitt, you know, five million for being in the film, and that's really what raises the budget that much. Yeah, the actors do tend to raise budgets quite a bit. Um, there are a lot of other fees. Marketing, actually, I would say is one of the most expensive aspects of film. Uh, but actors are starting to work more and more to scale, meaning they have a salary as a percentage of what the total budget of the film is. Uh, that's happened recently with some films that, uh, well, I don't want to name drop, but there are some A-list actors that are working to scale. They don't want to say it because it would devalue their price and people want to bargain them down. So we'll leave it at that. But, you know, the thing that makes crowdfunding so significant is this psychological shift. So the way arts used to be done, I'm talking back in the, before the classical era, before Beethoven, you would have a patron, a duke would hire you to come over and play music at their house. Right. And film had a potential of being somewhat the same way, where you could commission somebody to go out and do a particular project. And we see that sometimes with grants and uh, documentary type films. But crowdfunding has sent the reversal of, instead of using a sales model, we're seeing more of a patronage model. Meaning that, uh, a good example actually would be um, a video game high school. or Yeah, video game high school. So, uh, Freddie W and his team of friends over there that you see on YouTube all the time, they see it as an opportunity to say, hey fans, you like our work, we have this great story concept, invest in us, and you get to be a part of our supporting fan base. So they're looking at it from the same concept of before Beethoven, because Beethoven was the first one that came up with, you know what, why play music for somebody when I can just write it on sheets and then sell copies of those things? And then he kind of came up with the sales model for the arts. Well, now we're seeing a reverse. We're going back to the fact that, hey, 
if everything is so piratable, everything is so, you know, it's easy to get online, we have a, a plethora of content, you know, this age of abundance. You know, there are more films on, online now that you could see it, than That's you can true. ever see in your entire lifetime. And f over somewhere around 50,000 feature length films, you know, the, the large 90 minute type films made a year, how are you going to get to seeing all that content? So at this point, it's easier for people, especially in independence, to focus on finding a core audience and building an affinity with them. And crowdfunding is one of the one of the symptoms of that, where they finance their projects through that particular fan group. So basically, you go and you find the audience that wants to see your idea, and then they fund it. So in crowdfunding, do you actually make money, or is the money going solely to the production of the movie? Now, what people should be doing if they think about budgeting and paying for their time is they should basically pay themselves a salary out of the crowdfunding that they do. Uh, you know, people could expect when they're doing crowdfunding that, and there's some certain percentages, and, and my company, we've been data scraping sites like Kickstarter for about mm -hmm. a little over half a year now and trying to understand, like, where the money's going, where it came from, the psychological impact of when people donate, why they donate, how much they're willing to donate. Uh, and, but when it comes down to the budgeting portion of it, you know, you're going to, uh, usually per platform it varies a bit, but about 8% of your total gross is going to go to the platform. Hopefully you don't spend a lot of money on physical perks and merchandise because that have to, you have to ship it. And so that takes about 20% out of your budget. Uh, another 20 to 25% probably went to your marketing costs and the time spent on the campaign. And what's left over is hopefully for your project. So out of that, you're responsible for budgeting, okay, well, I need this much for a camera or a studio if you're a musician or if you're an artist for paint, but you need to pay yourself for your own time. And it may mean that you're not going to end up with very much money at the end of your crowdfunding campaign. So hopefully what you did was you valued the people that contributed to you and you stay in touch with them because if they're donating to you the first time, they might donate again or uh, do regular payments. And I'm not reinventing the wheel by saying that because if you look at any nonprofit organization, they know they do membership drives and fundraising uh, throughout different times of the year. Or even better, they put you on a uh, you know a reoccurring monthly donation uh, program. So ten bucks a month, you know, uh, that's better than trying to ask somebody to shell out fifty bucks of their discretionary income at one single time. So what I like about this model is that basically you can contribute to uh, your entertainment. So if you are, you know, really into sci-fi movies, you can start investing in sci-fi movies and they will come more. If you're into comedy, find a comedy production company, invest in them, and they will create more and more of the content that you're interested in. Exactly. And as we're seeing more and more transparency because the content creators, whether, you know, fine arts or a musician or a filmmaker, what they're realizing is is that once they have the trust of their audience, they have to be transparent with that audience. And they have to accept that there is some creative control that should be shared with the audience. I mean, you can't be a filmmaker and go make your own passion project and assume that people are going to donate to you. That's, that's ridiculous. Uh, I want to give an example. There are some folks that are not actually far from you, Yafat, where you're at. Uh, they're uh, south of you in San Antonio. And they did a crowdfunding campaign for a little over $171,000 uh, called Unbranded. It's on Kickstarter. You can check that out. And what's unique about that is the fact that they said, hey, we want to fund this trip that takes us on these horses up through you know, the plains of Texas into Canada. And along the way, we're going to see these wild Mustangs. Well, this is a great opportunity to show this in a documentary format. Well, let's reach out to a really good cinematographer and some professional photographers to take video of this. Well, to fund the whole operation, they needed, you know, some capital, and so crowdfunding made a lot of sense for them. But what they did that was smart was say, okay, yes, we're telling our particular story, but we're really, we're the voices or the mouthpieces for others that have a similar interest. So they reached out to at least three key major organizations. Uh, Cowgirl, uh, it's a uh, Cowgirl Museum in South Texas. Uh, they reached out to Horseman Magazine, and they reached out to a, the Mustang uh, Preservation Foundation or something along those lines. And what they did was say, "Hey, look, we're going to tell your story, and uh, in, a, in a, or something that's relevant to you guys. Would you please share this through your mailing list? Will you please talk about us on Facebook?" And they were able to generate a lot of money in a reasonable amount of time. And what I find so amazing about the project was the fact that their conversion rate, meaning 
the number of people that viewed the video on the Kickstarter page that converted, it was over 50%. So that That's means amazing. one in two people converted, which is incredibly, ridiculously awesome. Yeah. So, so, <laughs> like, I'm just like, all these questions are like running in my mind. So, like, let's say I want to start a you or anyone who's watching this uh, want to start a crowdfunding campaign. What are the steps or the mistakes that they should avoid, and how would they go about getting one in two to join them? Okay, that's a good point. So um, the best thing you can start off with in a crowdfunding campaign is understand that it's all about traffic. You have to drive a very significant amount of traffic to the page, whatever platform. It does not matter what platform you're on in many cases. Uh, in fact, that's one of the major follies for many is they assume that if they get on a platform like you know, Indiegogo or Kickstarter, that they, if you build it, they will come. Uh, that's not going to happen. Uh, even if you get featured on the front page of that platform, it, it does increase some traffic, but it may not be qualified traffic, meaning it could be someone that's just browsing. Whereas the example of Unbranded, uh, they knew exactly who they were hitting. Uh, you can look at some of the examples Tim Ferriss talks about you know, running a, a crowdfunding campaign in 10 days. And the significant thing they did is say, look, where are we going to find the people that care about this? Where can we promote it? Who is the top you know, 10% of, of uh you know, organizations or blogs that we can reach out to. Where is the traffic going to come from? And they center their strategy completely around that on where the traffic's going to come from based on who cares. And yeah. as a creator, as a creative person, you have to understand who is your audience because that's what you're dependent on. You know, it's not finding uh, some rich person to float your whole, you know, vacation to Tahiti and your project. It's, it's trying to develop a relationship with a group of people that want to support you. So how did, I mean, I was surprised when I saw Iron Sky, and I didn't realize so many people cared about Nazis in space. <laughs> how did they even go about their project to raise that kind of money? Well, they were interesting because they brought their uh, team to South by Southwest in Austin, Texas just last year while they also had a premiere of their film. It was the U.S. premiere. And they talked about how they had spent about six years generating audience and building up their website. Oh, wow. And if you check out ironsky.net, which is where they're based out of, there might be a hyphen between Iron and Sky. But they are really good about making sure that there's, there are ways to engage with their audience what I've been so impressed about them is, see, they started out with doing a lot of visual effects on this web series kind of thing called Star Wreck. And it was, you know, low production value and kind of campy and that sort of thing, but it was about the effects, and they had a fun time with it. And they started contributing and talking to their audience. And, in fact, they've done a lot of really good infographics to explain the impact and power of them reaching out to their audience. They didn't, they didn't pay to have a bunch of extras casting in their film. They they released a, a statement saying, hey, we need help. Who wants to show up and be an extra in our film? And so they shot with a whole bunch of volunteers that were fans that wanted to participate. So oh. they saved money, and they let their audience participate in a meaningful way, which I keep saying that, but that's like the, the, the clearly strong, uh, like psychology, the, the philosophy behind successful crowdfunding or crowdsourcing or anything like that um, is to be able to interact and engage with your audience. So... You know, the audience uh, helped vote on different choices of, of different pieces of content. I've seen examples where in different campaigns, uh, the film will say, hey, audience, pick the top five movie posters for us. And in which case, what they'll do is uh, they let the audience have a sense of choice. And, you know, the film company will go ahead and pick the last final one. But it's pretty obvious that, yes, you know, the audience gets a chance to make a contribution. Just like you feel good about American Idol, that you... Hopefully you it isn't rigged, right? <laughs> but uh, <laughs> anyway, you, you feel that you get a chance to, to affect the, the final outcome of things, and so that's what this team did. Amanda Palmer, much the same way. You know, she was touring for quite some time. She had been interacting and, and delving into crowdfunding for quite a bit before she ended up doing her million-dollar-plus campaign, and uh, at the time before she launched, she had over 500,000 Twitter followers, but she was, you know, she had a, was in regular engagement with them. Uh, she was interacting. I mean, she let her fans paint on her during shows. I mean, uh, I have a friend who's a fan of hers, and, and she, he said that she's one of those people where after the show, uh, she would stay for the entire line of people to shake hands, do autographs, even though she was dog tired. And that kind of commitment for an artist to your audience really goes a long way. And so when you do a crowdfunding campaign at that point, you've already 
built the fan base, you've already been interacting with people, you have your media assets uh, ready to go, you're ready to launch. So now, those are impressive campaigns because they were doing this for six years before they did their campaign. Uh, someone, and I want to speak to people that have not yet built an audience, they're starting out, they might have their little clique of people that uh, are ready to take the next leap and do a campaign. Well, the thing is, is that, you know, you can definitely start working on that now in building an audience by, let's say, for example, you're going to do a film about a particular topic. There's probably a meetup group near you that has a group of people already assembling that care in some way about what your topic is going to be or what your art is about or what your message is. And you are, it's, you're responsible as an artist to go out and interact with those people and be a musician-like person in that you understand you have a responsibility to building fans. You have to build a relationship. Uh, it, until you have that, you know, a reasonable size, and I could say like, you know, a mailing list of let's say 2,000 to 50,000 people, uh, organization size, you're dependent upon organizations that already have amassed those members. So back to the example of Unbranded, they said, hey, we need to reach out to these other organizations and let them participate. And so part of the documentary, they start their journey on the horses from one of the corrals over there for the uh, Mustang Foundation. And so there's kind of like a little bit of product placement for that organization that wants to save the wild Mustangs from getting gunned down if they overpopulate in the, you know, the North Texas area. So the, the, the first problem I see is that a filmmaker or a creative person is not necessarily a marketer as well. And when you ask them to go out and interact with, um, with their audience and kind of do the marketing, maybe there's a little bit of a problem there that they don't really know how to go about that. Yeah, there's a, a growth process for a lot of folks when it comes to branding, learning how to do social media. There's a, there is a preferred format, just like when you write an essay in, in high school. You know, introduction, three, you know, uh, body paragraphs for, with each a different argument, supporting a conclusion and a thesis at the end. There's the same thing for social media. There is a right way to write a tweet and make sure that you're putting in a certain number of mentions and hashtags and the composition. If you don't know those things, I, I, there is nothing wrong. In fact, I highly encourage going out and linking up with a social media strategist and or an internet marketer, um, someone that does web design. And these are people that need to be on your team. It makes sense. You're going to go out as a filmmaker and you're going to hopefully get a producer if you're not business-minded yourself. And you're going to find also a cinematographer and someone that does editing. If you don't do it yourself, you still should find someone that does editing because you can't be a one-man <laughs> band. That only works in Mary Poppins. <laughs> um, so anyway, yeah, in fact, that's a major folly for a lot of folks is they feel they have to do it on their own. And the truth is, is no. Uh, if you can't get over the fact of, you know, reaching out to subject matter experts around you, how are you going to interact with an audience? How are you going to become a Kevin Smith and, and be able to constantly talk to people? And you don't have to be a super guru on texting or doing uh, Twitter. You could just do blogs like Ted Hope is a good example in the film industry who regularly comes out with different content and sometimes he's sharing content that other people have written but he wants to make sure that his audience is informed and people appreciate that about him and so he has a huge fan base uh, hoplites I guess hope lights you call them I guess uh, but yeah that's the deal uh, reach out to a media expert and there are people that are you know from the, all ranges in their career coming out of high school to uh, you know they've been working in SEO for say six seven years and they, uh, you start with buying a beer and you work into trying to find a way to afford them uh, because you are, you are taking their time and their expertise. Uh, but a lot of times, you know, I understand where younger filmmakers don't really know, they, they don't have a budget to start with. You know, it is like a startup company. And so one of the things that they're faced with is just trying to ascertain basic knowledge. Um, so you know, it sounds like... Proficient, but do reach out. So you're getting into the point where crowdfunding and crowdsourcing kind of mix together, right? Because if yes. you crowdsource, you can start getting help um, without paying for it. Yeah, I mean, you're still going to pay in some way. You, you should be reciprocating in some well, way. Yeah. Uh, you know, the filmmaker, when you work in a business situation, a lot of what you're giving away is your equity when you don't have money. You're giving a piece of your intellectual property to an investor. When you're working with an audience, what you're sharing is your creative control. You're saying, you know what, I don't care if my main character is on a skateboard or on roller skates. 
let the audience decide. It's a small feature that doesn't change the plot that much, uh, unless for some reason roller skates is necessary to beat the bad guy, because that's like the prop at the end or whatever. But you as a filmmaker need to understand that you're not making a film for yourself. You're making it for an audience. And it is your job to be the vessel or the, uh, the voice of that group of people. And the film or the music or the, the, the painting or whatever, that's just the medium in which you communicate a message that resonates with a larger group of people. Uh, if it. you can't figure that out, then you know, maybe you're better off going back to the 1930s and working in the oligarchies of the studio system. So which one of the um, social media channels would you say is the best place to start? Because I know a lot of people just go to Kickstarter, put a project out there, and nothing happens. It's a ghost town. <laughs> yeah, I mean, you know, there are some very strong channels in which to communicate with uh, that encourages it. I, what you're alluding to is like a conversion rate uh, <laughs> that's reasonable. Um, it really depends where your audience is. Okay, if your audience is on Facebook, if there are strong supporters of different nonprofit organizations, use Facebook as a means to connect with them uh, and have an, a, a, an honest and genuine conversation and solicit opinions. You don't have to take them all. Uh, Twitter is a great way to do it. It takes a little bit more of a, I would say, an energy, and you got to keep up on it and, and checking all the time. Uh, it, it takes a lot of energy for me, at least. That's not what I'm as good at. Blogging is also really, really strong, and I feel that for larger amounts of content that's significant, that's good. I'm really fascinated in looking into, uh, as I'm exploring these different channels and looking at what's really converting, as we study this uh, analytically, we're working with some folks at the University of Texas right now, uh, their, their master's uh, program over at, um, at Macomb School of Business is actually setting forth people to figure out what details success and, and where the, where's the money coming from. Uh, what they're learning and, and we're working with them on is whether Google Hangouts will have a significant impact. I and think so. I'm really much a fan of the idea because it gives a chance, like when you look at Obama's address and, uh, for example, the uh, Dark Horse was a film done by Ted Hope and his team. They actually held a little bit of a conference on, on I believe it was um, Reddit, and they were talking and communicating with that community there. Well, they're also exploring different other opportunities in which to hey, sit down and do a Q&A with the, with the artists and, and also with the actors. So you don't have to just see the back behind the scenes of the film through the BTS, we call it behind the scenes. Uh, at the DV, you know, on the DVD, you can actually engage with them during the process of producing the film. And what does that take? You know, Friday night, have everybody go out and see the buy the VOD of the film and, and afterwards come and join us for a hangout about what took to make the film and where we're at and what the next project is and really build that connection with the audience um, and have a community out of it. I love it because I think like you, the technology is now making it so, I call it the cheers effect, so yeah. where everybody knows your name. So if, um, if people are using hangouts and technologies to actually get to know their audience or their supporters or their fans, everything will become closer, right? The relationships become closer, you'll feel you're engaged, you have a contribution, you have a little voice that actually makes a difference, and, um, and it will ripple. I mean, the joy, the, everything that will come out of it. So yeah. I guess my next question is, are people not going to get paid that much for film anymore? I mean, we're not going to see this $10 million or, you know, $50 million film with effects and everything. Everything will be done through YouTube and Netflix. Are well, theaters going away? <laughs> It'll be interesting. So, just in the way print format, I mean, look at industries before film. So, you, print is ahead of music, and music is ahead of film, and film is really slow to figure things out. Uh, but why change what they think is working, right? Uh, yeah. I, I mean, I look at the fact that VOD is still considered an afterthought for distribution. Uh, to me, that's kind of ridiculous. Talk about what is VOD? Uh, video on demand, I'm sorry. Video on demand. Yeah, thank you for stopping me for using jargon. Uh, so video on demand or pay-per-view, that is going to become more and more of a, a major player and can you know, uh, push significant revenue into the hands of filmmakers. Though people aren't excited about it in the film industry because they don't think it yields a lot of, of profit. Well, they're also not putting a lot of marketing into it, so duh. But um, what we're seeing right now, and, and I'm going to... I'm gonna, I'm going to try to predict or prognosticate the future in a little way based on some significant actions that have taken. 
So platforms like Kickstarter have actually joined forces in a strategic partnership with the Sundance Institute. Sundance Institute is a portion of the Sundance Film Festival, which is one of the premier film festivals in the United States right now. And it also has a channel where you can distribute films, meaning just like through TV, and, and they're looking at some, they may already have online options. But what's significant now is you'll see a filmmaker possibly fund their project on Kickstarter and then get into cahoots with the Sundance Institute because there's a connection there, and then end up on the Sundance channel. We've already seen a platform like Indiegogo uh, form a strategic partnership, and actually I think they're also owned, they own uh, Distriber. Distriber is a type of aggregator and sales agent group that for a fixed flat fee, you can get on multiple platforms. Um, Jason Brubaker is a, is a good guy to look into that, that uh, speaks more about that. But, um, and he's, he's also, if that's someone I think you would really enjoy chatting with because he really understands internet marketing the way film would be able to use it. But uh, yeah, so what will happen is, is we're seeing almost like a, a resurgence of the, the oligarchy again. Same fact that Amazon signed a contract recently with Disney to distribute exclusive content which is a huge, angry point of contention for many of the other distribution platforms. Uh, so what we're seeing is, is that while the oligarchy that I'm speaking of was the 1930s where the studio did the production, did the distribution, and did the exhibition. And because of antitrust laws, the government broke them up. Well, now we're seeing where these crowdfunding platforms like Seed and Spark, uh, Indiegogo, Kickstarter, they're now having their hand in the fundraising and the development process of films and then they're, you know, able to kind of pass it on to a, you know, finishing funds kind of organization or a exhibition distribution kind of organization. So we may see where people, an artist, hopefully this, it doesn't go too far where you see now these YouTube content creators become, say, YouTube partners, and then now they're locked in and signed permanently to YouTube, and they got to distribute on YouTube Play. And so we see where instead of being a free agent model, we see, well, are you just like Mac versus PC kind of thing? You know, you, it's, it's all or nothing kind of deal where you're, you know, Indiegogo to Distriber and out, or you're uh, working with Kickstarter to Sundance to Sundance, you know, channel. Uh, will people get locked into this? Time will tell. But I'm seeing that that's kind of, it's, it's protecting profit margins and it's a strategic advantage as, as now everybody and their mother can set up a, a, a platform now mm -hmm. that streams video content. So even though Google Play is competing with you know Hulu Plus and some of these others, good grief, there are, uh, in Austin, Texas right now, there are two new video platforms. One's called Film.TV. Um, uh, they're, they're offering free entry to put your content on there right now, and the funding goes directly back to the filmmaker. They're not looking for a cut. Their angle is they're there to help you market it which is the one thing that nobody has figured out yet. Uh, About the market films? They don't know. You know, you may have Amazon, and you may have all the, the, the shopping cart for merchandise. You may have production figured out. You may have development figured out, you know, crowdfunding. But it all comes down to marketing. You know, mm -hmm. if you can't market your idea, your Kickstarter campaign will not be successful, or your crowdfunding campaign on Indiegogo or whatever. Uh, if you can't get it to the right audience, Nobody will see it on iTunes. I, there are a lot of folks that are friends of mine that are very smart people, but they're still frustrated because though their content gets on iTunes, iTunes has you know so much traffic, but their stuff falls along the queue somewhere that people never get to at the bottom of the list. Maybe because they put Z's in the title, and so it, alphabetically it shows up at the bottom and nobody gets to it. Uh, Brian, could I ask a question? Sure. By all um, I've got a really old school background in what you're talking about. I mean, this is back when we were cutting film. Oh, good. Um, very different. But I understand what you're saying about video on demand and these other channels. However, in, in terms of distribution, mm -hmm. don't you, wouldn't it be logical that this is going to go through a growth process very similar to what the film industry did initially where people were locked in by contract to a distribution channel or another and then grew out of that to the point where there were multiple channels 
uh, of distribution that could be used. Um, wouldn't that be a logical growth curve, even though it's highly accelerated in this day and age? Oh, sure. No, you know, that's a good question. By the way, I want to say I have a lot of uh, appreciation for you when you mentioned cutting film. Uh, I actually learned on, before the nonlinear systems, I did learn on those back in the day for journalism. So I, that's awesome that you got that experience. I, I think maybe I was doing it different with two wheels and a, and a knife. <laughs> and some oh, tape. good. Oh, right. <laughs> I mean, this was real old school. But yeah, Excellent. no, I've done 16 millimeter and uh -huh. uh, sound and all that stuff. So I've got some background in it and then mm -hmm. thought I was too smart to finish film school. and <laughs> That cost me a little bit. Uh, but I do, I'm very interested in what you're saying. But isn't this also, let me back, off, back into that same yes. question. Isn't this also for indie productions? what we traditionally call the indie school. You know, I've got the Newport Beach Festival and you've got Sundance and that sort of thing. That's not where you're going to find Sly Stallone making $5 million profit, isn't it? Uh, right. Am I seeing that right? Well, yeah, you're going in a good direction with that question. So uh, let's take a look at the fact that, yes, there is growth in any industry with new platforms and there is an accelerated XS curve. And for our time with VOD and pay-per-view, it may be very short uh, in terms of the, the maturity. What we do have exactly right now is about, there, last time I checked, it was about 56 platforms worldwide, okay, whether you're in B Sky B in the UK, Orange Network, the big five here in the United States, uh, like iTunes, Netflix, and so on. Um, what I'm seeing, though, in the contracts that are coming with those deals is that the filmmaker, it's non-exclusive meaning that you can have your independent film and you can distribute on all these different platforms as long as you meet their criteria, which a lot of it has come down to getting the right deliverables uh, and having it a decent production value. Um, you can get on these platforms all at the same time. It's not exclusive. It's very open. The fees to get on them, you probably, if you're a studio, you can get a better price fix. For example, when you're working with someone like uh, say you have Avatar and you go to approach Netflix, they do for a flat, you know, advance, a flat amount of money. You're not getting pay-per-view or royalties or anything like that. Uh, they're able to dictate or command a larger amount of money from Netflix, you know, because they have Avatar. Who's not going to want to see that? Now, the independent filmmaker, they might make maybe a five-figure sum when they're selling their film to that platform. If they go to someplace like iTunes, you know, they could see some around maybe a, a 30% cut goes to iTunes and the filmmaker would, well, the, whoever's distributing and is in the middle there would get their cut. Uh, so uh, Amazon's around 50. They do a 50-50 split, uh, so it's not as uh, enticing. But what we're seeing right now is that uh, as an independent, you aren't locked in contracts to which platform you use and that there are better deals with different ones depending on uh, how much money you want to make or what's easier to drive traffic to. But one thing to also consider is, is that regardless of what platform you get on, you're still primarily responsible for driving the traffic. They just offer you the convenience of already having a bunch of people on there trolling their site to look for good content. And so it is becoming more and more democratic for the film industry, whether you're an independent or a studio, they both can get on these platforms at the same time. So does that answer your question, well, at least in a couple ways? Well, yes, and, and leads me to another, if Efat doesn't mind me following no, up. No, no, no. Um, Efat is the queen here, so you do, it's Valentine's Day, we really need to remember that. Um, <laughs> is there a directory that, of all these services, uh, Brian? Is there, is, there, uh, is there a specific blog that track, that curates what's going on, to use the current term, that curates what's going on within those platforms? Yeah, there are different companies that are, that are keeping track on these evolving industries, like what's going on in Brazil right now. And I would recommend, there are a couple people that I think are, are highly credible and have some good experience to start with. One is Stacy Parks at filmspecific.com. Uh, the other one to touch base with is Jason Brubaker. Uh, he's on filmmaking stuff, and we, one of the other. Will, group... um, Brian, would you uh, just give me these names, and we'll sure. add them to the comments below? Oh yeah, definitely. We'll do. Yeah, go for and it. And then the last one that I encourage you to check out is the Film Collaborative. 
uh, with Orly Ravid and her team over there. It's an amazing group because what they do is they actually, for a really low flat fee, will do a lot of consultation and talk about your distribution opportunities and channels. Um, I, I find right now there is no massive like professional directory, and it just takes some due diligence to find all these. Uh, because what you'll you also don't know, or they don't bother to tell you, because distribution companies or the exhi exhibition companies, these platforms, uh, they're great at marketing, but they don't seem to really get out very well when they're doing it. Uh, you may have a company that, say, there's a couple in uh, Scandinavia, but they're actually owned by HBO. So the confusion is over whether you're supposed to approach HBO and specifically ask about their Scandinavian video-on-demand distribution platforms, or you approach that group directly. So sure. there is a lot of hunt and peck for a lot of these, and uh, there are some changes as certain companies are buying others. But the, the VOD market overall seems to be settling down quite a bit, and so you're seeing some of the major players. And I would just encourage you to check out those three resources and then continue to explore what other options exist because, uh, like I say, there's a group called OnBuzz uh, that's based out of Austin, but they're, you know, they're national, and they go for family films. That's what their, their content is designed for. And they have both a, um, the freemium model, so you're, pay, you're basically paid by ads, uh, so it's ad supported, or they both they also have the pay per view model in their platform. So you can put your film on their pay per view, and then once you feel that the run is over, meaning enough people have seen it, they're willing to pay for it, you can switch it over to the ad model uh, if you're not getting enough views and that sort of thing. So these platforms are very flexible, and it seems like there are a lot of more options for the independent filmmaker this time. Not that I'm ever going back in film business, although I've got a couple books I'd like to see produced. Mm -hmm. um, and I should have been a producer, not trying to be behind the camera. Um, do you find that there's a... I hear you talking about the theatrical films. However, it was my experience previously that the indie film that was probably easiest to get funded was the documentary on a specific subject that had a specific audience mm -hmm. that you could uh, go for. Uh, so what's your like, feeling about that? Sounds like what you're saying is like find a group that is interested in something and then go do a documentary about what they're interested in? Well, for example, I'm, I'm pretty passionate about, uh, you mentioned horses and mustangs and all that. I'm pretty passionate on, on some areas of that subject and uh, uh, could uh, build a build a script or a build a uh, uh, story platform around that. I could storyboard. It's what I'm trying to say, Brian. Right. Uh, I could storyboard that. Mm -hmm. uh, then that has a very specific equestrian audience, and then secondarily, you've got uh, bleeding heart liberals like myself that will just jump in because of the poor horses. Oh yeah. <laughs> and uh, and so you can appeal to both those groups. Is that a viable way of approaching, is, is documentary viable in this platform first, and is that methodology of approaching a documentary uh, viable in your opinion, or at least semi-viable? You know, you really, I'm glad you brought up this question because this is a perfect question to answer the differences between, say, a genre and a theme. So like you expressed, a documentary is very easy to target a group of people because they care about a theme, whereas you see a lot of other narrative films, let's say, so the, the fiction-based films, uh, they tend to be more on the genre. So you hear words like an action thriller, uh, slasher, romance, comedy. Now, Western. What, yeah, Western. <laughs> yes, exactly, right? So what say, happens, you've seen me, uh, Brian. Excuse me. You've seen yeah. me for the very first time on the Efat show when I don't have my cowboy hat on. Oh my goodness! Because I, because I honestly am a Westerner, but I forgot and left it down in the car, and then I saw her come on the air. So nobody oh, yeah, recognizes well, I, me. So anyway, sorry to interrupt. Oh, you're fine. You're fine. So the, uh, the so this it's excellent that you brought that up because what what basically is happening here is that we're noticing that with online marketing it's easier to find a particular audience to do both narrative and documentary, like what you're asking. The difference in from the past is, let's say you want to do a Western film. The, the film industry would use big data to say, okay, there's so many males between the ages of you know, 25 and 
38 and another category over that that are into the, you know, they're buying this much type of music, they probably shop, you know, these stores, and, and they're trying to just use a real general concept for, uh, because you fit this profile, you must probably want to buy the film. And they set their entire budget to that and their expectations on distribution. Well, now what you can go do is you can do some basic sleuthing, and there's some tools for this, uh, some you have to build, that basically tell you, all right, how many people are out there on Facebook that have friended or fanned a site about westerns and, and horses and equestrian society? And you know, oh, well, the audience for this is only so many million. Well, then if even a certain portion of them convert to purchase and participate or pay for the film, you're only going to make this amount of money back. And so you can set the budget and the size of your project to the actual oh, audience. And instead of making your film based on, well, I'd love horses, and it's going to be a western as a genre. Now, what's the story? Oh, it's a it's a love triangle between a man, his dog, and his horse. One's got to get put down because he doesn't have the medication for him. You know, maybe that I'm just throwing that out there. But uh, is that really the, the that's going based from a genre perspective? I would encourage people to look at it from a theme perspective. It's about trying to save uh, animals' lives and the relationship with man versus animals, caretaker. Uh, oh, that was very good. You know what the that was a nice conversion in the way you just did that. Exactly. So you're you're looking at it from a when they talk about the new film paradigm shift, they're really talking about the way you think about approaching film. You know, people look at it from a slate of genres. Ted Hope, uh, who's I would say the the don or the king of of independent filmmaking. You know, he expresses multiple times that if you want to know what films to make now, look at films that are uh, having to do with the top thirty cause issue based themes globally, whether it's water rights in Peru, animal safety. In fact, uh, we were talking with some representatives of uh, Austin Pets Alive, which is a group in Austin, and there are some others. But there are basically no-kill uh, nonprofit organizations for pets and animals. You know, they're animals that are on red alert. They're basically going to have to euthanize them. And so they, they blast everybody in their membership group saying, hey, someone please help us find adoptions for these animals. And so what ends up happening, you know, Alex, you know, the little Cocker Spaniel is going to get put down this week. And so everybody in their social network goes out there and says, come on, we need to find somebody to take care of this animal. And it's highly successful. And Austin as a city is getting a lot of accolades right now because of their no-kill uh, city, you know, ratings for, like, uh, animal rights groups and things like that are really happy about this. So um, their model is is showing that there is a success in trying to create – content and stories and narratives around a very important issue. It's not just a pet movie. This isn't a Disney's Homeward Bound. It's about the theme. And so I would encourage anybody who's going to uh, adapt a book. Uh, you, you said you had a couple that in mind that you like. Uh, however those get uh, you know, ad adapted to the film concept, um, it's, it's important, at least especially from a marketing standpoint, to strengthen whatever the themes are and, because that's what people are emotionally going to connect with. So let's talk about, uh, we have five more minutes. So let's try to give some actionable items to uh, the people who are watching this. If you want to go about crowdfunding, regard, uh, whether it's film or your business or your idea or your hobby or your trip somewhere, um, what should be uh, the first steps that you should take and how can you make that successful? And you mentioned a few, Brian. You talked about finding the audience, right? Mm -hmm. Finding first the audience, if they have a mailing list, connecting with them on the mailing list. Mm -hmm. Are there any, like, you know, do this first, do second, third, fourth? So the first question that is really more, uh, I would say, asking yourself, what am I really trying to achieve? And, and, and just like any a business, a personal endeavor, you have to come up with a mission statement. Why are we doing this? Are we doing this because I need experience making film or I need to get my album made so I can get discovered? You know, what is, what is the purpose? Uh, and then you ask yourself, okay, uh, who around me can I bounce ideas on and start collaborating with people you already are comfortable with? You can't DIY. DIY, I want to make t-shirts that say DIY stupid because people think DIY means you do it all on your own because if you don't do it on your own, then you don't really deserve the credit that you get. And, and the truth is, is like you work with hundreds and hundreds of people, you're going to go to the film festival or you're the head, you know, the axe man for the band, you're still going to get all the accolades. No one's going to say, oh, well, you had to get help from your drummer or you had to get help from your cinematographer to look, make this movie look good. 
um, you need to do it with others. You need to collaborate. And so first picking your mission statement, second finding your key collaborators, and third then you go out and start looking for your audience. And you may find that your message has to change a bit, that the, the intent or the direction of your project will alter in slightly. Um, but especially if you're an unknown person, if you don't have a fan base currently, you need to basically serve, you're, you're a servant to the a voice for that group of people. And it is your job to use whatever your medium is, whether it's you know fine arts, music, film, uh, you're using that as a vehicle to share that message with people. So that's those are the top first three things I can just say right off the top of my head. Everything else beyond that uh, is a little more technical. And so I would say, you know, the next step is to sit down and start doing some math on, okay, if I need to raise this amount of money, how many people have to donate, therefore, how many people do I have to ask? And use a 1% conversion rule unless you get, you know, a tighter, a tighter bit of uh, math and formulas. Um, I, I could plug myself here and say that uh, the art company does reports on the technical aspect, but I think that most people, what they're really needing right now is just the first three. It's... It's you know figuring out what their mission statement is, who are the key collaborators, and then going out and actually finding their audience and kind of vetting their ideas with them. And not get attached to your idea, right? Because it's going to change if you're crowdsourcing and crowdfunding. Yeah, I mean you're not giving equity up to people that are crowdfunding you, uh, that are supporting you through patronage. You're you're sharing creative control. You don't have to share a lot, but you need to at least let allow them to participate in a meaningful way. So we are almost on time. Any other question, guys? Are there any projects that you need crowdsourcing or you can use crowdfunding for? No questions, but I wanted to mention, interrupt Stuart. I wanted to interrupt him earlier, but didn't have a chance to so interrupt now. I, I did get, get a little bit kind of taken aback because there's no cowboy hat, but I finally <laughs> recognized it was him. And he mentioned something about being uh, you know, happy Valentine's. Valentine's is no big deal today. It's Ifad's birthday. That's what's a big deal today. So <laughs> oh, that's right. Thank you, Oleg. <laughs> this is so sweet. I'm 21 again. <laughs> but in terms of uh, stuff, Brian, pleasure to listen to you, by the way. Um, you know, one of the things that just wanted to bring in for anybody who is you know, into looking into this, I had an experience with uh, an organization called Pledge Music, which is a crowdfunding type organization for musicians. And the particular project I was um, participating in as a, a, I mean, contributor basically in terms of um, being one of the crowdfunding people doing the actual funding was for one of, one of my favorite musicians of all time. So it was a very simple deal for him to sell this thing to, to basically an army of folks out there like myself who will pay almost any amount of money, not, not literally, but will definitely pay 15 bucks to, to, to get his CD when it comes out. He's a world famous known guy in, in this particular style of music. Mm -hmm. And so it, it's easy to see how for somebody who has that kind of notoriety, it's no big deal for them to come up with the money. Not that they really needed to crowdsource it, but I mean crowdfund it, but, but they did. And and you know they got it and it was the, but in terms of them there was no control, he was not giving any control in terms of what they're doing. All he was doing is co coming up with the money to pay for this project. But because so many people know him, you know he doesn't have to give anything up there. And I think with most people who try to do independent films and things like that, they're not in the same boat. Nobody knows them, and so that becomes a totally different story. But I think in terms of um, if you look at internet marketing in general, mm -hmm. uh, how people used to do it a few years ago and it, a lot of people still do it now is it, you know you had the concept of affiliate marketing meaning you have other people yes sell your product or service and as part of the you know a part of this uh, situation they would get cut of whatever mo money you would normally make for basically like a referral fee if you will and mm -hmm. so I think in this crowdfunding thing you have a similar situation where you have somebody's putting on a film you're able to participate and you're not necessarily getting a cut, but the idea of participating in the project so you can get something out of it. And in, in this particular case, or in the case, I think, of a lot of films, and Brian, correct me if I'm wrong, the participation gives you a little videos that are behind the scenes, for example. Now, there's something that these producers give out to you as part of the process, so you get something. Not necessarily, it's not money, and it's not necessarily any kind of even 
uh, ability to control what the movie says. I mean, you don't go to somebody who is the next uh, George Lucas and tell him how to do movies. It just doesn't make any sense. In fact, I think, should. I, think, <laughs> I think it would be a problem. I mean, if you think about it, if you're going to have some sort of way to control part of the creative process, most you cannot find enough creative people, in my view, to, to be meaningful if you're a really creative and, and solid person to, to, to bring in meaningful changes because that's not what they are. They're just people coming in. They like movies about horses. They may be passionate about the subject. They want to contribute. That doesn't mean that they know anything about how to make movies or anything to do with, with the process of making movies. So to me, I think it would be a mistake to have somebody come in saying, well, we'll let you participate and you have you know certain creative control over the movie that kills the whole concept of the movie in the first place. I think, at least to me, it would. So you're feeling that the concern is, uh, as a as an artist, the risk of giving up too much creative control would dilute the value or the artistic endeavor uh, of the project. It would totally. And and also you're suggesting that the people that are already famous don't ever need to give up creative control because of the fact that they're already famous and they have a fan base that's going to support them no matter what. Exactly, exactly. Okay. But in case of this other deal that I was saying, the, the earlier part, is that you know, if you're talking about people who are participating in some kind of project they believe in, the fact that you're feeding them certain things that they would like to get, you know, as their interested parties, like you mentioned, that I think right there is the key thing to keeping them on board. I think that's all. You don't need to have them participate in a creative process, but as long as you're giving them some things, or if you can bring somebody who is, for example, famous, to be part of this project, just participation in something where there's a minor part done by, it doesn't have to be Robert De Niro, but uh, I don't know who to put in, somebody who's less known, let's put in, but reasonably known. That alone right there gives a lot of exclusivity. So that's another thing to do is if you can get somebody, lend somebody decent, known, I shouldn't say decent, but known entity into your project, that already gives you a heads up in terms of that. But this sure, deal with sure. feeding people so something for free, that's the key thing of keeping people interested because... Well, free is one way to go. I, I would have to agree with you in the aspect that it's nice to get free merchandise. I mean, everybody loves to have cool stuff to decorate their, their place with and, you know, above their computer monitor between Google Hangouts to, to ch you know, admire. Right. But at the same time, you know, there is, a, there is a career process. So, for example, the musician that you're referring to, they at a time were probably having to cater to the needs of whether it was club owners or whatever, even the audience, what song they want to hear during that set. Even the filmmaker, until you're Joss Whedon, you have to write scripts to spec, meaning whether it's an investor or a studio, they tell you exactly, this is what we want, here's the criteria, you will fit within these confines, otherwise we can hire somebody else. And yeah, until well, this you guy move is beyond into Joss Whedon, career, so. what's that? This guy is beyond Joss Whedon, so he, he's on the ball. I mean, he's, oh, he's a He's above, yeah, so, so, the, so the cool thing, what I'm seeing with crowdfunding right now is that, yes, your master is not the studio or the, the publisher or the label that's asking you to do a certain type of content. Your master is the audience. They dictate whether they want to support you or not. So the, the ownership or the, the who's in the hot seat really is in, in control. And as an artist, it is your job to make sure that you're pleasing your, you know, whoever's the hand that feeds and at the same time, you want to maintain your own artistic integrity. There is a balance, and as you become more and more established, you can afford to uh, do more personal things. I mean, even looking at Amanda Palmer, I mean, she was collaborating. I mean, she's married to Neil Gaiman, so that kind of helps out a lot. But she mm -hmm. was collaborating with many other artists along the way in her crowdfunding campaign, and they were also advocating for her. So for someone who's starting out, you need to understand that it's, you know, the you can't be making your film or just your music album. You have to understand that you have a responsibility to your fans. And so it, you must uh, listen to what they have to say. That doesn't mean you need to give up 100% of your creative control because I agree, you get too many. I was looking into, uh, with a friend of mine, into a film about paragliding uh, that was a story about a girl that had came back from, uh, from Iraq and serving in the military and uh, was in an IED blast. And so as a result, wasn't able to do any more uh, jump out of airplanes anymore. She was airborne. Mm -hmm. And so the story is really about her kind of finding a way to connect with her father because uh, she was an only daughter. And uh, now that she was discharged from the military on, on medical reasons um, and him trying to get her into paragliding, which is a type of like hang gliding. And so uh, that story, though, uh, we were actually crowdsourcing 
feelings and concepts and ideas and even locations of where the film should be shot from the power gliding community. Well, there were some interesting ideas and some of the stuff was kind of silly, but at least they have a chance to feel that they were contributing. And so maybe out of that group, out of the solicitations that we did, about 10% of what they contributed would actually be usable in the, in the story. Because it is the filmmaker or the musician who is the expert to put all that together and tell a strong narrative. It, they are the professional. That's what they do. Um, but you can always take inspiration and input from an audience. And over time, uh, until you kind of you know filter out the kind of audience you want and you're down to the type of art you, you want to make, uh, that is part of your career growth. So I would say that there is a there is a difference in crowdfunding for people that are an unknown versus a celebrity. A celebrity already has their channels, they already have their mailing lists, they probably have uh, a website and everything going. And if you're an unknown, you're going to have to build it from scratch, and that takes it takes some time. Uh, even Amanda Palmer took her six years to put those people together for her crowdfunding campaign. I think you could do it faster uh, if you have a, a direct uh, idea of where you're going to go, and you're already engaging with your with your potential audience, um, but it, you know, it's, crowdfunding will be different for different people depending on where you're at in your career and your audience building skills. Guys, we are yep. seven minutes over time. Hold on a second. Okay. Uh, two things. One, Stuart has something to finish, and then um, Daria Musk is an awesome example of this. She built her entire career from crowdfunding from Google Hangouts. So, and even though that's music, you know, it might have been a little bit easier, but she still, she did it in a year and a half. She has over, I think, what, three million followers now, and she gets three, and she gets uh, a bunch of, you know, she shows on the road and funding and cell phone companies to fund her hangout, and she does it all on hangouts. So, totally viable, totally possible, even here. Stuart, and we're finishing. Yes, um, just one thing because I had it happen to myself in Hollywood years ago. Um, if you've got a specific story treatment, a specific story idea, and you write up a treatment, you start, uh, you're ready to start showing it to people. Please register it at the Writers Guild. Brian will shake his head, going, "Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I had a there was there was uh, some years ago." a major motion picture with a major star. It was her first actual acting role. She'd been just a body before that, and I wrote it. Uh, at least I wrote the story treatment, and they changed it. But I made the mistake of shopping it all over Hollywood uh, as a kid. You know, I was in my 20s, and just shopping it with everybody, and it got blown out of the water. And then a couple of years later, someone saw the my basic outline and took it and ran with it and made it into a really really good movie so I'm very proud of being part of it but please protect yourself whatever whatever your creative endeavor protect yourself that's in every business right um, so Brian thank you so much if you guys have any more questions about any of film industry crowdfunding crowdsourcing how to do stuff in the film industry in social media Brian's your guy um, you can follow him on Google Plus and Brian any other places I should find you yeah you know I'm really actually easy to find uh, through LinkedIn and I'm, I'm quite approachable I mean I don't bite uh, I'm the biggest thing <laughs> that I'm working on, what's that <laughs> only in person <laughs> I know right uh, so what ends up happening is is that uh, I'm working with a bunch of people at different levels mostly with academia right now to flesh out some of where these business models are headed for film. I'm really excited about where music is evolving. Uh, I'm The key buzzword that everybody should walk away with um, outside the crowdfunding is called direct-to-fan marketing. This is something where everything is going online and yeah, there'll be a place for the theaters and that isn't totally going to go away. But uh, it, especially depending on where you're at and your ability to get good distribution channels open to you. You know, if you had to go kiss the ring, go do that, but uh, online distribution is much easier, it's more democratic, uh, the price fixing is a lot lower, uh, you can engage with your audience and I would say more importantly you, they would also purchase, check out the ironsky.net site um, for the movie Iron Sky, they're selling merchandise on there you know and, and they're learning some lessons maybe even that Disney's actually on the heels of as well, that's why they're buying all those franchises, they realize that the films aren't going to be the ones that make them all the money, it's really all the merchandise that goes with it that's why George Lucas gave up the movie rights, but he kept all the merchandising rights. So, 
like Toy Story is basically a big commercial for toys. <laughs> exactly. That's a lot of what it is. And so, in fact, some of those films even lost money, uh, despite the fact that in the box office they make millions of dollars. But they know they're going to make their money back in merchandise. And so, as an artist, you know, your, your main content, maybe the, the, the music album is great or the, the film itself is great, but that is a, really the, the sauce for all the other things that you can possibly sell to your audience whether it's merchandise or uh, one of the big things that Lynn was talking about is access. You know, being able to get special behind-the-scenes footage, invited to go have lunch with uh, some of the, you know, the director and the producer, meet the actors, do a Google Hangout with them. I mean, they're all these different types of ways to allow people to participate in a meaningful way. They don't always have to influence your creative control or anything, but at least give people a chance to participate somehow. So thanks so much, Ryan. And again, you, you can find him online. And thank you so much for uh, joining us, all of you guys, and your great questions. And we'll see you next week.